Thanks. I'd like to welcome everyone to the AHRQ webinar, which is the first part of a webinar series on health information exchange. Although a few people are still logging in, we're going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Ellen Baycar. I'm a registered nurse, and I'll be moderating this webinar. I currently serve as a program official in the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement. Prior to joining AHRQ in July of 2015, I served as Senior Policy Advisor at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in the Office of Clinical Quality and Safety. At AHRQ, I work on the Health Information Technology Initiative, managing a large portfolio of grants supporting development of new evidence to inform policy and practice on how health information technology can improve the quality of healthcare. Before we get started, I need to go over a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll get right into the presentation. We will be recording this webinar and the recording will be available via the ASRQ Health IT YouTube channel. Copies of the PowerPoint slides were emailed to participants earlier today. And we are pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include William Hirsch and Karen Eden from Oregon Health and Science University who will lead the first presentation today. The second presentation will be led by Jenny Harvell, Elizabeth Polina Hall, and Larry Jessup from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. This webinar event is accredited by Professional Education Services Group. And for those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information about how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of the presentation and will also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me note that neither the presenters nor the sponsors of this event have any financial interest to disclose and no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Just a brief note about questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentation to address participant questions. However, during the presentations, feel free to submit questions that you have for the presenters in the Q&A panel. It's located on the right of the PowerPoint slides. As a reminder, you are in listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you will need to use the Q&A panel. As I mentioned a moment ago, today's webinar is the first in a series of two webinars that AHRQ is hosting on Health Information Exchange. The overall goal of today's webinar is to provide information on current challenges and possibilities in exchanging health information electronically. A second webinar scheduled for April 21st at 12.30 p.m. will discuss the use of HIE to support collaboration and promote care improvement in health organizations. If you are interested in attending the second webinar, you can register at the AHRQ HIT website. Okay, learning objectives. This slide shows the learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe the current use of health information exchange, HIE, in various healthcare settings. Discuss clinical and healthcare utilization outcomes associated with HIE in healthcare and other organizations. Identify the facilitators and barriers to implementation and sustainability of HIE in healthcare organizations. Describe practical tools and resources for implementing HIE in long-term post-acute care. Explain the benefits of HIE implementation in LT PAC settings. And describe existing policies advancing HIE and interoperability in LT PAC. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Bill Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch, MD, is Professor and Chair of the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology in the School of Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Hirsch is a leader and innovator in biomedical informatics, both in education and research. In education, Dr. Hirsch serves as Director of OHSU's Graduate Program in Biomedical Informatics. He also conceptualized and implemented the first offering of the American Medical Informatics Association 10 by 10 program, which has provided education to over 2,000 healthcare professionals and others in biomedical informatics. 
Dr. Hirsch has also made many contributions in research. His research originally focused in the area of information retrieval, where he has authored over 100 scientific papers, as well as the book, Information Retrieval, A Health and Biomedical Perspective. He has also conducted several systematic reviews of informatics-related areas, including health information exchange and telemedicine, telehealth. He is joined in this presentation by Karen Eden. Dr. Eden is Associate Professor in the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology in the School of Medicine at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Eden has a diverse research background that includes evidence-based medicine, decision modeling, electronic health records, and informed patient decision making. The focus of her original research career has been in translating evidence to help patients and providers make shared informed decisions. She has significant experience working with stakeholders providers, patients, and policymakers in creating these tools. She also serves on the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration that is establishing internationally approved standards for patient decision aid. These standards include presenting evidence in an unbiased and understandable way. Dr. Eden has also co-authored several systematic reviews related to decision aid, women's health, health information exchange. She also very recently contributed to developing an evidence map for telehealth. We will also be joined by Liz Selena Hall, Larry Jessup, and Jenny Harvell, who will speak on the topic of health information exchange in long-term care in post-acute settings. And now it is my pleasure to turn the control over to Dr. Bill Hirsch. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen, and um, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to present the findings of our uh, systematic review that was funded by AHRQ in this webinar. There's uh, quite a bit of uh, information that we uncovered in the systematic review, and we're really just going to present the highlights here. Um, there are a number of publications uh, from this work. One in the upper left-hand corner is a screenshot of the um, title page of the full report, uh, which is available on the ARC website at the link below it. We've also uh, published a couple journal articles that uh, distilled out um, uh, some aspects of it, and that's basically what uh, Dr. Eden and I are going to talk about today in terms of the, um, the use, uh, the, the outcomes achieved through HIE and then facilitators and barriers. Uh, we also have a chapter in a book that actually is just published this month on health information exchange edited by Dr. Brian Dixon of Indiana University, and uh, that book it has a lot of interesting information about HIE, uh, including a summary of our report. So in our um, talk that we give, Dr. Ed and I will talk about the rationale for HIE briefly, past work. Um, effectiveness, which is the area that my part of the systematic review focused on, barriers and facilitators, Dr. Eden's work, and then uh, we'll wrap up with some comments for future research before uh, turning over to the other presenters. So as um, you all probably know, the United States has made substantial investment in health information technology. Um, dating back to the beginning of the Obama administration, although there was actually plenty of work at ONC um, in the Bush administration before that, uh, the, the um, investment led to the HITECH, the Health in Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, which mainly put about $30 billion towards incentives to adopt electronic health records, and there was additional funding for state-based health information exchange, workforce development, and other activities. Um, the uh, High Tech Act had at least one uh, successful outcome, which was the rapid adoption of electronic health records in the U.S., and uh, ONC has done an excellent job at putting out data briefs that show the uh, tremendous uptick in uh, EHRs in uh, physician offices, hospitals, emergency departments, outpatient departments, and so forth. ONC has also uh, measured the uptake of health information exchange, and while the uptake has been um, pretty substantial, it has not quite uh, paralleled the uptake of electronic health records. There are a variety of reasons for that. 
um, such as uh, lack of standards and interoperability, lack of business cases and sustainability and things like that, which we'll touch on a little bit in our systematic review. So what is the value of health information exchange? We approach this from the standpoint of looking at evidence in scientific studies. That's, of course, not the only way to determine whether something has value, but uh, AHRQ funds a number of systematic reviews or evidence reports through its effective healthcare program, mostly on clinical topics, and one approach is to look at what the scientific literature shows. We undertook a systematic review where you exhaustively search the literature and synthesize it to determine answers to questions. And we looked at four major aspects of health information exchange, effectiveness, use, implementation, and sustainability. We'll focus on effectiveness and implementation in this uh, presentation. Uh, just for those who are not uh, completely familiar with systematic reviews. This is a technique that's used across medicine, uh, whether it's clinical topics or IT-related topics or others. Uh, basically, you do an exhaustive literature review aiming to identify all studies that meet certain inclusion criteria. In the case of health care treatments, for example, you look for randomized controlled trials. It's a little more challenging in areas like health IT because the evidence can be highly varied, the studies don't look at the same questions and so forth. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Cochrane Collaboration, which is an international effort that has aimed to uh, carry out systematic reviews on topics across all of medicine. Um, one important point to remember about systematic reviews is that they're only as good as the underlying studies that were reviewed. So if the uh, underlying studies were poor or suboptimal, then the review itself is, is going to reflect that and you won't be able to reach the kinds of conclusions that you might if there's a tremendous amount of evidence. We found with Health Information Exchange that there are a number of studies, they, they don't always answer all the questions, they don't answer them the same way and so forth, and um, it presents opportunities actually for future research. Um, it should be noted that ours is not the only systematic review of HIE. There was actually one that was performed about a half decade ago um, by Hincapi et al. published in Applied Clinical Informatics. And then as we came to learn while we were carrying out our systematic review, there were two other groups that were doing systematic reviews as well. Uh, a group, um, uh, Rudin et al. at the RAND Corporation and their systematic review uh, was published um, while we were doing ours in Annals of Internal Medicine, and then Raherkar and Joshua Vest uh, published another um, systematic review as well. Each of these reviews was slightly different. We took slightly different perspectives, although probably our conclusions that the um, uh, amount of evidence available at this point is intermediate, so we, we can't make strong conclusions about uh, the value of uh, HIE, but we certainly um, can look at what some of these studies have showed. Um, this is a really busy slide. I, it's only here just to point out the uh, process. There's a, there's a very uh, deliberate process that one goes through for systematic reviews. You always employ a librarian who can uh, exhaustively search the literature. This generates uh, oftentimes thousands of abstracts that need to be reviewed, and then the uh, reviewers of the abstracts will designate certain ones to look at the full text of the article, and we did that, and then as we found articles that met our inclusion criteria, um, bucketed them into the four major question areas, and of course some studies address more than one question, um, but um, again, we'll just focus in this talk on the the outcomes that were looked at in studies of HIE, and then the facilitators and barriers. Um, in terms of the outcomes or effectiveness of HIE, we identified 34 studies for inclusion. Our literature search went up through um, about, uh, I think, mid-2015, so there might be some studies in the literature that have appeared since then. 
um, that are not in our systematic review. Um, of these 34 studies, 26 of them were experimental studies where specific things were measured, and then eight of them were survey studies that reported um, perceptions of outcomes, asking uh, clinicians or patients or others on their perceptions of the value of HIE. The studies that, that were experimental, um, we actually had hoped to find studies that might look at, at patient out direct patient outcomes, um, things like uh, mortality, uh, uh, improved uh, care of disease and so forth. Um, unfortunately, all of the studies really only looked at uh, so-called intermediate outcomes, so uh, criteria that, were, that are known to be associated with improved health care, such as quality measures um, and so forth, and then also um, economic um, uh, kinds of outcomes in, in terms of uh, spending, test ordering, et cetera. Um, very few of these studies were randomized controlled trials. Uh, as we'll talk later, it's, a, it's difficult to do randomized controlled trials of something like HIE that is not itself a test or a treatment. It's a tool that's used to deliver health care. So most of the studies were retrospective cohort type analyses where Groups were evaluated retrospectively and then compared across, against some kind of control group. Um, there were also cross-sectional studies of, of databases and um, a couple of case series reports. So we um, identified all the studies that met the criteria and then grouped them into categories of outcomes. And this list here can be thought of as the kinds of activities that people use HIE for and which were studied. Of course, there's probably other, there are other uses of HIE, um, but in this case, uh, in, in the case of these studies, this is what has actually been studied and reported about in uh, scientific literature. So the impact on laboratory testing, radiology testing, hospital admissions, readmissions, costs in emergency department, referrals and consultations, quality of care in ambulatory settings, public health reporting, and then there's a few other miscellaneous studies. And I will, in my remaining slides, uh, give a high-level summary in all of these areas, and then I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Eden. So in, uh, for laboratory testing, we identified six studies. Five of them showed benefit, although the, um, they, they showed benefit in reducing overall tests, although the estimates of the impact on cost were mixed. Um, none of these studies really looked at whether the testing, the change in testing was beneficial or harmful for patients. So it was really just looking at whether test ordering was reduced because perhaps the test had been ordered in another setting and that was um, discovered through HIE. But there was not any um, evidence that, that patient diagnosis was improved or made worse uh, by this. So. Um, uh, Four of these studies of the five studies showing benefit took place in emergency departments, and then another couple studies were conducted in ambulatory settings, um, with one sh actually showing an increase in testing, although that was probably just due to other factors, which is always a challenge in retrospective studies. You can uh, oftentimes cannot control for confounders of other things going on in the healthcare system, um, and that, but one study in ambulatory setting did show a reduction. For the radiology studies, um, uh, seven of them in emergency departments showed that there was some reduced testing. Um, uh, two in ambulatory uh, settings had the same uh, outcomes as the laboratory studies with one, um, or actually one showed a decrease and the other one um, showed no change in the face of, a of increased testing. Um, one of the hopes for health information exchange is that we can avoid hospital admissions and readmissions. Um, we found eight studies that looked at hospital admissions. Two of them found a reduction in hospital admissions and, and lower costs. Um, three of them also uh, measured some benefit for um, HIE in reducing um, admissions, although the other three found no such reduction. So some studies showed that the presence of HIE did not lead to uh, reduced admissions. Um, in terms of readmissions, uh, one study showed a benefit for HIE uh, being present, the other one did not. 
Um, in terms of um, uh, other uh, aspects that were looked at, a couple studies looked at costs in emergency departments and finding that there was reduced spending in terms of, of the direct test ordering. Um, unfortunately, these studies didn't really look at the big uh, picture in terms of how much money was um, either saved or not saved by the emergency department overall, how it impacted the larger um, financial picture of the institution, so the hospital where those emergency departments uh, resided. So while these studies showed a benefit, um, the uh, amount of reduction in spending was relatively small um, when you have, for example, a million dollars in reduced spending in an emergency department, that's probably a good thing. Um, on the other hand, um, most hospitals are um, multi-million and billion dollar organizations, so then the question becomes um, um, how much um, impact a million dollars in reduced spending has. Um, other studies looked at uh, referrals. Um, finding that uh, HIE did in instances lead to reduced referrals, presumably because information was there. And a couple studies looked at quality of care. Um, one study was a retrospective study that uh, found a correlation between users of HIE and performance on quality of care measures. Of course, that was just an association. Uh, we don't necessarily know the cause and effect, but the, um, those who did use HIE had, um, uh, were able to, uh, were also found to achieve improved um, uh, results on quality of care measures. Um, another uh, randomized control trial on medication reconciliation um, found increased ability to detect um, medications that were not necessary, but was unable to show um, improvement in um, adherence uh, uh, by the clinicians and patients afterwards. Um, there were a few studies in public health that found that um, uh, HIE did lead to um, some improved um, laboratory reporting, um, identifying um, HIE patient, uh, HIV patients for follow-up. Um, and then a few other studies, um, one study showing a reduction in time for processing Social Security disability claims, um, another um, reporting the increased ability to identify frequent emergency departments and users who presumably um, then could, could uh, be intervened on to perhaps find other less uh, costly ways to provide care. Um, and then um, another study showing that those who had um, uh, HIA implementation also had higher patient satisfaction scores in hospitals. And again, that's uh, an association that we don't necessarily know the cause and effect. So in conclusion, uh, for these groups of studies I presented, um, most of them were limited by their retrospective nature, so the, all sorts of potential confounders, and also limited questions um, of, of emergency department costs um, uh, focused on, on the absolute reduction in costs and not the kind of larger picture and, and the relative contribution that that makes. Um, there uh, are not, to our knowledge, any studies of patient-specific clinical outcomes. Um, and then, as always happens with health IT, uh, many of these studies were done in places that were leaders in health information exchange and always raises the question of whether or not uh, the results can be generalized. So I will um, now uh, turn over right next to me here to my colleague, uh, Dr. Karen Eden. Thank you. So we're going to shift and, and talk about now some of the barriers and facilitators to exchanging health information. When we conducted this study, we learned that information is not fully exchanged and we identified several barriers and facilitators to actual use. So within the same evidence report that Bill just described, we identified 10 cross-sectional studies, seven multiple site case studies, and two before-after studies. The data sources included surveys, interviews, focus group sessions, observations from 292 health professionals, and these were non-clinicians, and 402 clinicians in the U.S. We also found additional information from European studies, although this was primarily dominated by a very large survey of 31 countries on e-health. The settings were diverse. They looked at exchange between emergency departments, ambulatory um, care clinics, and hospitals, and this made stratification by setting difficult. <clears throat> For this part of the report, um, we used 
content analysis and qualitative synthesis to identify concepts. And these concepts were sorted into groupings related to barriers and facilitators of actual HIE. Two investigators used an iterative open coding approach to refine the groupings and themes until consensus was achieved. These themes were then refined and a third investigator reviewed the final grouping. We identified 15 barriers and 20 facilitators and they fell into three broad categories, completeness of information, organization and workflow, and technology and user needs. I'll start with um, completeness of information. We know that clinicians won't continue exchanging information if they can't find the needed information at the time when they need it. Completeness of information was affected by several factors. Privacy and security was a concern raised by both clinicians and patients. Clinicians also expressed concern about liability. But both of these barriers can be addressed with robust policy and training. While some patients were outside the catchment, those inside may not be well matched, and probabilistic matching algorithms may help with this. Incomplete information was also addressed with careful consideration about the consent process addressing this with online authorization and also at registration. Incomplete information was mentioned as a barrier in the U.S., but not in European studies, and this may be partially due to concern over health system competition within the U.S. So now I'm going to transition to organization and workflow. The most frequently cited barrier was a disruptive login process that might require multiple logins and passwords. A single login process would resolve this barrier. The most commonly cited facilitator was a workflow that included non-physician proxy users, for example, medical assistants, admitting clerks, nurses. This approach saved clinician time and addressed needs of clinicians with limited privileges. These studies also reported that proxy users had different purposes than clinicians for using the HIE. The nurse or MA would look for summary documents of recent hospitalizations, discharge summaries, it would print this summary off for the clinician. By contrast, the clinicians might browse online information for decision making. One evaluation of the Mid-South eHealth Alliance reported that use dropped significantly after a new policy prohibiting registers and nursing from searching the nurses from searching the exchange. Initially, the registers and nurses would print off this summary sheet for the providers clinicians and queries assistance for needed information based on the summary sheet. When this policy was changed to prohibit proxy users, use declined. It is also important to provide technical support to reinforce the new workflow related to HIE. This new technology requires need for social change to address resistance to change. And finally, the sites with the most use collected ongoing data on clinician access and feedback to increase use. I'm going to move, shift to technology and user needs. <clears throat> the sites with the most use had automatic integration with existing clinician systems. Data were pushed forward rather than requiring querying. Sites with competing hospital systems had more complete information and were less likely to have physicians querying for data with, um, with an HIE. Several studies stated that the reports produced by HIE may not, be, may not meet the needs of clinicians. These reports may have too much information or lack important context um, information for patient care. Inclusion, inclusion of clinicians and proxy users in the design of the report may address this barrier. Two studies describe the lack of data standards in HIE, and more work is needed to address this barrier. We noticed that there really were challenges even in identifying barriers and facilitators. A key challenge in identifying these is the changing nature of HIE and the workflow locally. For example, in a process of rolling out an exchange system, often hidden inefficiencies in the workflow may emerge. Once the workflow is revised to incorporate HIE, the workflow will become more efficient. However, the opposite also can be true. As time passes, the features of the HIE may become less efficient. For example, if 
so much data is provided that the, pay, the providers are overwhelmed with the information, they may require new tools to focus their search. A second key challenge is understanding use of the lack of standard HIE classification and terminology. In order to identify functions and architectures that facilitate use, it will be necessary for the development and research communities to agree on standard classification and descriptions of system architectures. There was also lack of consistent or coherent theoretical framework underlying the implementations or the evaluations of HIE. We identified really two main areas for future work. The evidence was inadequate to compare barriers to HIE use by function, that is query-based or pull, or versus directed or pushed exchange, or by type of architecture, centralized or not. Understanding optimal, optimal functionality in HIE is challenged by the lack of consistent classification and terminology of HIE and the changing nature of the social technological systems involved. And finally, while the evidence is currently incomplete, there were several facilitators that showed promise in promoting electronic health data exchange. Obtaining more complete information, thoughtful implementation and workflow, and including users in identifying key functions for HIE use and reporting. Thank, thank you, Karen. And I will just wrap up by uh, making a few comments. Our, our entire team um, also addressed um, future research needs in our report and, and journal articles that were published. Um, and clearly, we need more rigorous research methods, um, both um, emanating from uh, the analysis of that I undertook in terms of the outcomes looking at how uh, HIE impacts uh, healthcare, um, individual health, patient health, even public health and so forth, and also um, uh, Dr. Eden's um, uh, need for better classification and categorization of, of HIE systems and approaches and so forth. Uh, these are not always well described in literature that's published about um, HIE. Another big challenge, of course, is how, how do we actually evaluate HIE? As I stated at the beginning, um, HIE is not a, a test, it's, it's not a, a treatment, um, it's something that we use to, to perform better testing and better treatment. So we need to, um, we, we can't necessarily apply the traditional randomized controlled trial methods of, of uh, assigning uh, either um, patients, clinicians, healthcare systems, et cetera, to different interventions. It, it's, um, it can be done in some instances, but overall um, we need uh, additional methods. So what, what are, do we actually recommend? We discuss a number of approaches, certainly um, uh, better terminology, um, better uh, tracking and logging of, of HIE as it's used, um, and um, really kind of a more prospective approach where um, when HIE is implemented, it's studied, ho hopefully in a, a way that's not uh, excessively obtrusive for clinicians and healthcare organizations. Um, one thought that came to mind, um, because we see a lot of this going on uh, nationally, um, is the use of research data networks uh, that track patients where they get their care. Um, I mentioned PCORNET here. We also have the uh, President's Precision Medicine Initiative as well that will be building large cohorts of patients and perhaps um, as those come forward, if we find ways to track the information systems that are used in the care of those patients, we can glean some um, uh, inferences, some knowledge from that. Um, so there's, there's a lot that, that can be done uh, to, to better understand um, HIE, and of course the technology will be changing and um, will, that, that will need to be taken into account as well. So um, I will just uh, wrap up by acknowledging our uh, funders. Um, it was uh, mainly our contract by uh, AHRQ uh, through the um, Evidence-Based Practice Center program. Uh, one of our uh, authors was also a trainee on our National Library of Medicine um, Informatics Training Grant, and uh, we acknowledge that as well. Um, and if you have any further questions, uh, Questions for Dr. Eden or myself, uh, uh, you can obviously do it through this webinar, but uh, here are our email addresses uh, as well. So I'm going to transfer now to um, Jenny.
actually, this is Ellen. I'll um, grab it from you if you want to transfer it to me. Just a, a couple of things. You had mentioned <clears throat> to the folks that are listening that they can put questions into the Q&A panel and then we can um, have the presenters answer them at the end. And at this point, I want to introduce our second half of the presentation, the speakers that we have from ONC. First is Jenny Harbell. She has been a senior policy analyst in the Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, ASPE, since 1994. Jenny is on detail to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, Center for Clinical Standards and Quality, CCSQ, as a senior technical advisor assisting in the implementation of the IMPACT Act to make assessment data interoperable for health information exchange and in the development of the assessment data element library. Jenny's area of expertise includes post-acute and long-term care, eligibility, financing, quality, and health information technology and health information exchange. She provides leadership in the department and private sector on policies related to IT and health information exchange in post-acute care and long-term care. Liz Polina Hall is a nurse by background and currently serves as a long-term and post-acute care LT PATH coordinator in the policy team at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. In this role, she coordinates across ONC offices, HHS agencies, and federal partners to advance health IT adoption and interoperability across the care continuum, including rehabilitation facilities, nursing homes, home health, hospice, community-based support services, individuals, and caregivers. And Larry Jessup. Larry currently serves as the Program Director for Health Information Exchange Programs at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. In this role, he oversees health information exchange programs that expand health IT adoption, increase interoperable health information exchange, and increase the integration of health information in interoperable IT. Larry was also on the team that developed the Regional Extension Center Program, which has assisted more than 144,000 providers implement an EHR, and over 110,000 providers reach meaningful use stage one. Um, now at this point, control is over to Jenny. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Harvell, and um, we'll focus a little bit now on factors contributing to the use of health information exchange uh, with a focus in particular on long-term and post-acute care. There we go. Uh, we should now be on slide 38. Uh, so again, by way of background, uh, through the implementation of the High Tech uh, Act, um, approximately $15 billion in incentive payments uh, are estimated to uh, be available to support the adoption and meaningful use of certified electronic health record technologies uh, for certain uh, providers, um, for example, acute care hospitals and uh, physicians for their meaningful use uh, of that technology, uh, and that funding and the meaningful use is to support quality, safety, and uh, coordination of care improvements um, while achieving efficiency gains. In addition, uh, through the high-tech legislation, uh, about $2 billion was made available to the Office of the National Coordinator uh, to support the development of the nationwide health IT infrastructure. Uh, and again, these funds uh, primarily targeted those providers who are eligible for the EHR incentive uh, programs. Although uh, ONC made some high-tech funds, um, about $7 million of funding available to support health information exchange um, by long-term and post-acute care providers, um, the, the high-tech funds generally were not available to support the acquisition or use of health IT or EHRs by providers who are not eligible for the incentive program. So why, and moving on now to slide 40, uh, so why post-acute care matters? Uh, this slide um, highlights, uh, I think, very nicely why post-acute care matters. Um, briefly, there are about 33,000 post-acute care providers who serve almost 7 million Medicare beneficiaries on behalf of whom Medicare spends almost uh, $74 billion a year, nearly 15% of uh, Medicare total annual spending. A focus on post-acute care is critically important to support uh, improvements in care, care coordination, uh, beneficiaries' lives, and how uh, Medicare pays for these services. So uh, this 
slide describes um, a couple of different things. Uh, why electronic health information exchange is needed, and then moving into uh, the fact that it's limited. Transitions in care uh, between providers who are eligible for the incentive programs and providers who are not eligible um, are, is common. For example, in 2008, uh, almost 40% of Medicare beneficiaries who were discharged from acute care hospitals went on to receive services in a post-acute care setting. And of these individuals, more than 15% were readmitted to the acute care hospital within 30 days of their uh, acute care hospital discharge. In addition, instances of shared care between uh, providers who are eligible for the EHR incentive programs and those who are not are also common. Uh, for example, uh, Medicare requires that both the attending physician and the home health agency delivering services to a beneficiary sign the home health plan of care. Uh, however, um, national data is limited regarding the actual use of health IT and EHRs by long-term and post-acute care providers. Um, surveys of long-term uh, post-acute care providers um, are typically not, uh, regarding their EHR or technology use, um, are typically not national in scope, and the data, the focus of these surveys uh, varies uh, widely across each of the surveys. Um, as a result, when you look at the findings from these surveys, adoption rates vary from less than 10% uh, to more than 40%. Uh, and again, this is largely a function of, of sampling techniques and also the focus of the technology questions that are included in these surveys. Further, uh, technology adoption rates uh, for long-term post-acute care providers cannot and should not be compared with adoption rates that have been reported uh, for uh, eligible professionals and eligible hospitals. Again, they do not measure comparable uh, technologies. Nonetheless, uh, despite these serious limitations in the availability of national data, uh, technology adoption rates are believed to be uh, lower uh, among uh, long-term post-acute care providers uh, in comparison to providers who are eligible for the incentive uh, programs. Electronic health information exchange by long-term post-acute care uh, providers is believed to be even lower still, and interoperable health information exchange by long-term post-acute care providers is believed to be rare. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, ASPE, uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services has sponsored uh, research on health information exchange in uh, long-term post-acute care and on behalf of individuals who receive these services um, over the last several years. Um, key findings uh, from these studies include um, information regarding drivers and barriers to the uh, use of and engagement in health information exchange. Um, some of the key drivers for health information exchange uh, between long-term post-acute care and their trading partners, such as hospitals and physicians, include the availability of grant funds from the Office of the National Coordinator, and also the uh, recent implementations of various payment and service delivery reforms, including um, hospital readmission payment penalties, uh, and also service delivery reforms, such as uh, integrated delivery systems, uh, accountable care organizations and other bundled payment uh, arrangements. Barriers to the adoption of uh, information exchange by long-term post-acute care providers include costs uh, related to exchange as well as costs associated with uh, the technology. Um, until recently, there have been relatively few requirements for those providers who are eligible uh, for the EHR incentive program to actually uh, exchange information, including exchange, exchanging information with uh, those who are ineligible for um, the incentive programs. There are also several technology challenges that um, providers who, long-term post-acute care providers who do adopt technology encounter. Uh, however, there's limited uh, tech, uh, technical assistance available to this sector um, to support their uh, use of technology and uh, engagement in information exchange. 
I'm going to highlight um, uh, in the balance of my presentation a key policy driver for information exchange uh, in long-term post-acute care. Uh, in 2014, the IMPACT Act uh, was signed into law, and the IMPACT Act um, establishes several requirements. Um, two of those requirements include uh, the requirement that um, long-term, excuse me, post-acute care providers, um, those providers that are listed on this slide, submit standardized assessment data uh, by certain dates um, specified in the statute. The standardized assessment data um, have, uh, are based on um, data in assessment instruments that CMS has required the electronic submission um, by these providers um, over, um, over time, and uh, the IMPACT Act requires that in certain um, quality measure domains and assessment categories that CMS standardize uh, those data elements. In addition, uh, the Act requires that CMS make interoperable uh, standardized assessment data uh, and uh, uh, quality and data needed for quality measures in order to allow for the exchange of data among post-acute care providers and other providers in order to uh, facilitate and support care coordination and improved outcomes. So why impact, why, why now? Well, um, CMS has long recognized the lack of comparable information across post-acute care settings. Uh, undermines, limits the ability to evaluate and differentiate um, appropriate care uh, across settings um, for and by individuals uh, and their caregivers. Standardized uh, post-acute care assessment data is anticipated to um, allow continued beneficiary access to care in the most appropriate setting uh, while also enabling CMS to compare quality of care across post-acute care settings. In addition, uh, standardized assessment data is anticipated to allow for post-acute care payment reform, including site neutral or uh, bundled payment. Standardizing and making interoperable assessment data will also allow uh, improvements in hospital and post-acute care discharge planning and um, the transfer of health information across the care continuum. In addition, and finally on this slide, um, standardized and interoperable assessment data is expected to support a variety of uh, service delivery reforms. So CMS has uh, established a uh, quality strategy, and through this uh, strategy, CMS seeks to transform the healthcare system to deliver better care, uh, improve our spending on healthcare dollars in a smart, smarter way, and put consumers at the center of care, keeping them engaged and healthy. The quality strategy identifies um, six goals or um, uh, priority areas, including making the individual the center of care, promoting communications and care coordination, and um, improving uh, effective treatment. The strategy is built on several foundation, uh, foundational principles that are identified on this slide. Um, and for purposes of this presentation, I think enabling innovation and strengthening the infrastructure and data systems are um, particularly uh, germane or applicable to the um, provisions in the IMPACT Act. So the goals of the IMPACT Act are supported by and are aligned with the uh, CMS quality strategy. So um, data element standardization, as I noted, is a uh, key focus of the IMPACT Act. And achieving data element standardization that is aligning these assessment data elements uh, across the post-acute care assessment instruments um, is expected to improve care and communication for individuals uh, across the care continuum. Uh, we anticipate that it will enable uh, a shared understanding and use of clinical information, support the reuse of data elements for a variety of purposes, including transitions of care, care planning, clinical decision support, and other activities. Um, in addition, we expect that it will um, also su support and influence CMS and industry efforts to advance interoperable health information exchange and care coordination. And just a, an important note for um, individuals who work in uh, post-acute care settings, while data element standardization is required in the IMPACT Act, 
um, for these quality measure domains and uh, assessment categories. Um, it is still anticipated that uh, unique uh, assessment data elements will um, persist uh, in uh, certain post-acute care settings. Uh, the Impact Act um, also requires that CMS uh, make these assessment data elements interoperable, as I um, mentioned. Uh, the Act specifically requires um, that interoperability is needed to allow for the exchange of data among post-acute providers and with other providers, and the use of such data is needed uh, to provide access to longitudinal information to facil facilitate coordinated care and improved outcomes. So um, mapping the post-acute care assessment data elements to nationally accepted health IT standards is one of the activities that CMS is presently involved with. Um, and we anticipate that um, mapping these assessment data elements to these nationally accepted health IT standards uh, will support information exchange and reuse by providers across the care continuum. Um, and those, some of those providers are listed on this slide as well as uh, information exchange with health information exchange organizations. We also anticipate that uh, the mapping to health IT standards will uh, support the use and reuse of assessment data for a variety of uh, different document types, including transfer uh, documents, referral documents, care plans, and other documents. Um, CMS, as it continues with its mapping of assessment data elements to nationally accepted standards, uh, will uh, make available to the public uh, uh, these mapping relationships so that providers and their vendors will be able to see uh, how these data elements uh, map to uh, particular standards. Uh, my last um, point that I want to make before turning it over to Liz uh, is uh, in addition to the requirements about standardization and interoperability in the Impact Act, the Act also establishes several quality measures, one of which is a quality measure on the transfer of health information and care preferences. This slide um, presents the um, requirement for this measure. Uh, the measure is required uh, to reflect the transfer of individual health information and care preferences uh, to the individual family caregivers and service providers when the individual transitions from the acute care hospital or critical access hospital to another setting, including post-acute care, a post-acute care provider or home, and uh, from post-acute care providers to another setting, including different post-acute care providers, an acute care hospital, critical access hospital, or home. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Polina Hall. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Okay. Um, so, as um, in addition to the Impact uh, Act, and, and as Jenny noted, um, we really believe that delivery system reform will uh, be driving revolutionary change across uh, the healthcare ecosystem. And so, really moving us from this historical state, where uh, which is characterized by incentives for volume and fragmented care and the fee for service model, to a future state where um, care is uh, more patient centered and uh, Care and care coordination um, is, is prioritized, and there's an emphasis on value and quality. Um, and um, we want to highlight then the, one of the announcements from the Secretary of Last that uh, was made last year around the HHS goals for Medicare value-based payments. So uh, the first goal, goal being um, where 30% of Medicare payments are tied to quality or value to alternative payment models by the end of 2016, and 85% of fee-for-service Medicare payments are tied to quality or value, again, by the end of the year. And so for the first time, policy and payment and technology are really pushing us and enabling us to better connect with each other and to other parts of the healthcare and support services system. And these new connections are really driven by business imperative to provide care uh, safely and more efficiently. And in this slide, we just want to highlight the CMS innovation models that align with delivery system reform. So the models in red represent initiatives with relevance to long-term care, and they range from various ACO models to bundles to initiatives targeted at uh, individuals eligible for both the Medicare and Medicaid uh, program, often referred to as the DUALS, and the state innovation model initiative. 
And in order to be successful, what many of these models have in common is the need to share information across providers and with patients and caregivers, uh, which can, of course, uh, be enabled through health IT. And another um, important lever that we want to highlight was uh, the recent um, uh, publishing of uh, an update to guidance of, from the state Medicaid director's level, letter, which is focused on the use of high-tech administrative, administrative funds. So at the end of February, the CMS uh, Medicaid Data and Systems Group and ONC Office of Policy partnered to update guidance on how states could support health information exchange and interoperable systems to best support Medicaid providers in attesting to meaningful use stage two and stage three. So prior versions of the guidance uh, were limited uh, in scope uh, to uh, eligible providers, uh, but with this update and subject to uh, CMS approval, states may now be able to claim the 90% high-tech match for expenditures related to connecting eligible providers to other Medicaid providers. So again, focus is on connecting eligible providers to other Medicaid providers, including providers um, in long-term care, home health, pharmacy, labs, behavioral health, uh, and so on. And for more information uh, on the uh, guidance, you can click on the link provided in the slide. We really believe that this is, uh, will be a tremendous opportunity for states to begin connecting providers across their re regions to promote uh, better communication and uh, improve care. So on this next slide, uh, we just want to shift and talk a little bit about the inter uh, interoperability vision for the future. Um, that will be critical to achieving some of these uh, delivery system reform goals and, and, and business imperatives we've been talking about. So in, in 2015, ONC published uh, some key reports to support the health IT and interoperability needs of the nation over the next several years. Two of the key reports were the Federal Health IT Strategic Plan and the Shared Nationwide Interoperability Roadmap. The strategic plan describes how the federal government intends to advance the nation towards achieving high-quality care, lower cost, and healthy population through the use of information and technology. The fourth goal outlined in the strategic plan will be met through the implementation of the Shared Nationwide Interoperability Roadmap. Um, and the roadmap really presents actionable steps over an incremental timeline, so over the next three, six, and 10 years, to guide how the country can achieve an interoperable health IT infrastructure. But first, how is interoperability defined? Well, the, the roadmap defines interoperability as the ability of the system to exchange electronic information with and use electronic health information from other systems without special effort on the part of the user. So an analogy that I like to use is if you were to, uh, sending a letter to a recipient but the recipient only speaks English and the letter is written in French, while the letter may have been transmitted, the contents of the letter cannot be understood and meaningfully used. Likewise, with interoperability, it is not enough to simply send the information but includes the ability to use that information. So one key aspect of interoperability is also uh, around capturing and sharing the right data in the right format so it can be used multiple times to support health and the wellness of the individual and population. So again, we mentioned uh, that there are uh, these overarching interoperability uh, goals over um, uh, an incremental series of years. So the first um, near-term goal is around sending, receiving, finding, and using priority do uh, data domains to improve healthcare quality and outcome. And I'll talk a little bit about what those priority data domains are in the next a few slides. But in the next six years, it's really around expanding data sources to uh, include other kinds of information, such as information from social services or mobile health technology, telehealth, um, and incorporating that into an interoperable health IT ecosystem. And in 10 years, trying to achieve uh, uh, an interoperability ecosystem to enable a learning health system with the person at the center. Um, it's also, we also want to highlight that ONC did uh, publish uh, the 2015 edition Health IT Certification uh, last year, and it contains new and updated vocabulary content and transport standards to support interoperability um, and focus on structured uh, recording exchange of that health information. It also establishes a common clinical data set uh, to encourage the exchange of a core set of data across the care continuum. 
And one of the most important aspects, I think, is the fact that the program is really agnostic to settings and programs. So while it continues to support the EHR incentive program, it has applicability, of course, to other kinds of, of settings and use cases, which include long-term care, behavioral health, chronic care management, among others. So in this example, we just want to call out some of the uh, example criteria that could be of re uh, relevance to long-term care, um, particularly those uh, criteria that are focused on interoperability. Um, they include transitions of care, uh, clinical information rec reconciliation and incorporation, and care plan certification criteria. And just want to highlight as well that the transitions of care and care plan certification criteria were informed um, uh, by and large part by the long-term care community. Um, and uh, the second and third rows, just for clarity, are uh, required uh, criteria to help support the criteria that were highlighted in this example on the first row. So you mentioned the common clinical data set. So this was renamed uh, from prior versions of certification. It was formerly called the Common Meaningful Use Data Set but renamed to, uh, with the recognition that this data is really important to supporting care across the continuum. Again, it, um, it, as outlined in the uh, near-term goal in the roadmap around um, sending, finding, uh, using, receiving priority data domains, this is an example of that key information. So it includes um, information such as demographics, procedures, problems, labs, meds, et cetera. The information highlighted in red represents the new data added to this data set, and the highlight in blue is a data that was, uh, includes updated standards. We just want to also call out the fact that ONC will be publishing on a yearly basis what's known as the 2016 Standards Advisory, and this complements um, the, the 2015 certification program. It identifies the best available standards and implementation specifications for interoperability of clinical information in any given year. So while the standards that are included in the advisory, in the advisory may be adopted in regulation, uh, the advisory is non-binding, but it serves as a way to provide clarity and predictability for the public regarding ONC's best assessment of the best available standards for a given interoperability need. Um, it's completely plausible that the um, the standards in the advisory may be ahead of where regulatory requirements are, and in fact may serve for the basis of further action and discussion uh, between industry and government. So in summary, to increase uh, interoperability across the care continuum, um, you know, we need to determine successful models for implementation and replicate these where um, appropriate. We'll need to explore alternatives for financing health IT, um, particularly for providers that were not included in meaningful use incentive programs such as long-term care, um, and these could include from uh, risk, shared risk models as well as um, ongoing collaboration that will be needed among federal, state, and industry partners. Uh, in terms of near-term near success, we believe this will, uh, there will need to be an increased proportion of individuals and other providers, including long-term care providers, that will be able to uh, send and receive uh, information um, from, from inside their uh, facilities to outside sources and be able to, uh, again, receive that information and use that information to inform decision making. Um, and the next slide, I'm just these are just a resource uh, slide with links to the documents that uh, were mentioned. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry Jessup, who will talk about uh, ONC's grant programs that include long-term post-acute care. Great. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you all for the opportunity to share some of the work that is uh, occurring out in the field as a result of recent funding um, that's really aimed at uh, advancing the near-term goals of the ONC Interoperability Roadmap, uh, the Federal Health IT Strategic Plan, uh, and some of the other initiatives uh, that Liz spoke about a moment ago. So funding amounts and awards. Um, it's important to note here that this is not uh, new funding, um, but instead funding that was re-obligated from the previous state HIE cooperative agreement program. Uh, so since this program is operating under the same legislative intent, um, we've really tried to build off of the successes, uh, best practices, and lessons learned of the previous program. Uh, so total amount of funding available is $29.6 million, and again, this is uh, re-obligated dollars. 
Uh, we received 37 applications for our program, uh, so this is a very, very competitive process. Uh, we were able to make 12 awards, um, and our period of performance is two years. Uh, so these awards were made uh, in late July, uh, so we are uh, just at the seven and a half to eight month mark at this point. So this is a listing of all of the uh, program awards that were made, uh, and a, a few things that stand out about our awardees. Uh, first, we have pretty good reach uh, since our awards represent all 10 HHS regions. Um, 10 of the 12 are focused on uh, long-term and post-acute care as our target population. Uh, nine of the 12 are also focused on uh, behavioral health integration. Uh, and 10 of the 12 are from states uh, that are state innovation model awardees. Uh, and I have an asterisk here uh, next to those awardees who have selected uh, long-term post-acute care as their target population. We also have a, a second program uh, here at ONC that's focused on interoperability and exchange, uh, which is led by uh, my colleague, Rachel Abbey. Uh, and while this program is only one year, uh, there's critical work being done at the community level um, around interoperability and exchange, um, and the Ultimed Health Services Corporation, uh, they have proposed to work with uh, skilled nursing facilities and acute rehab facilities as well. Uh, this is a list of all the awardees for the Community Interoperability Program. Uh, very similar goals in alignment with the roadmap, um, with the focus again on creating projects at the community level um, to increase health information exchange. Um, and again, an asterisk uh, next to the Ultimate Health Services Corporation, uh, who'll be working with uh, skilled nursing facilities and acute rehab facilities. So target populations. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there are various target populations across the entire care continuum with whom our awardees are collectively working with. Uh, one thing in particular to note here is the number of non-eligibles uh, that our awardees are supporting. Uh, as part of their application, they had to select um, one eligible and two non-eligible target populations, um, and eligible being defined as eligible for the uh, EHR incentive program. Uh, and the goal behind that was to try and make sure that we focused on those target populations that historically had not been incentivized or lacked the resources and technical assistance uh, to move forward with health IT. Uh, so for the purposes of our call, um, I've bolded the LTPAC target population on this slide. Um, but in addition to the LTPAC setting, um, both clinical and non-clinical caregivers across the entire care continuum uh, are a focus for this program as well. So alignment with the ONC interoperability roadmap, um, there are three main goals or milestones for our program. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, there is intentional alignment with the roadmap. Uh, the, the first objective or the first milestone is uh, just working with our awardees to make sure that we are increasing um, the expansion and adoption of the critical health information exchange infrastructure that's needed for interoperable exchange to occur. Uh, the second milestone uh, is exchange um, and really looking to increase the flow of information and enable uh, send, receive, find, and use to improve uh, care transitions. And milestone three, of course, is uh, increasing interoperability of health information from external data sources um, and, you know, really looking to incorporate uh, health information into the day-to-day -day workflows and interaction with patients. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the work being done um, with LTPAC settings as part of our um, program. Uh, I'm more than happy to share uh, full summaries of the awardees proposed services or put you in touch with um, key contacts should you have uh, additional questions or um, require any further detail. Um, but just really quickly, uh, Delaware, Illinois, and Colorado um, are implementing use of the um, TI Transform tool. Uh, to translate assessment data into standardized CCDA templates. Um, the Rhode Island Quality Institute is sending ADT alerts to uh, LCPAC facilities, individuals, and their family members. Uh, New Jersey is working to send uh, ADT messages between uh, New Jersey Transition of Care Services uh, and their LCPAC facilities. Uh, and finally, uh, Utah is working to more efficiently send uh, discharge summaries um, from the hospital um, to the long-term post-acute care settings in their service area. Um, by and large, if we look at, uh, you know, all the awardees, uh, most are looking at how to increase the adoption of health information technology 
um, and increase exchange of transition to care documents uh, among the LCPAC setting. So this is just a, a list of the challenges for the LCPAC setting that our awardees have communicated. Um, I think both uh, Liz and Jenny have touched on uh, many of these already. Um, it is important uh, to note that these challenges should be viewed in context with our program uh, and the short timelines that our awardees have to conduct uh, outreach, education, uh, and really try and communicate a clear uh, business case or value add for the LCPAC setting, uh, given all the other um, priorities and challenges that exist um, for LCPACs across the board. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure these challenges uh, don't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, so I will not go down this list in its entirety, um, but I will instead give you all uh, some information on our uh, long-term post-acute care community practice, uh, which was developed specifically um, to mitigate uh, many of these issues uh, and discuss solutions to overcome these challenges. So as a response to the challenges uh, that I mentioned before, um, we developed the uh, LCPAC CLP, uh, which is led by Zoe Barber, who was one of the product officers in the Office of Programs and Engagement. Uh, and the, the main goal of the LCPAC community practice uh, was to identify and promote the value of health and patient exchange for LCPAC providers by defining the value proposition, addressing common barriers, and developing mitigation strategies to expand the use of HIE with providers across the entire continuum of care. And we tried to be uh, very deliberate with our objectives, um, just given the short timelines of our program um, and the short timelines of the community practice. Uh, so, based on feedback from our awardees and our subject matter experts, um, we came up with these uh, three objectives. Uh, and the first uh, is demonstrating the value proposition. Um, and this is just really looking at, um, you know, how do you demonstrate the value proposition for health IT? Um, how do you demonstrate the value proposition for health information exchange? And how do we identify the business case for LTPAC facilities? Uh, the second is making data usable. Uh, and this has two parts. Um, and the awardees are looking at uh, you know, how do we utilize health IT in the LTPAC setting uh, to receive and send uh, quality health information and quality data? And then secondly, mm -hmm. and then secondly, uh, how do we make this data actionable and ensure that uh, data that is exchanged between LTPAC facilities and other care providers across the entire care continuum is being relevant and useful for the LTPAC setting? And then third, uh, developing trust among partners. Um, and this is just really looking at all partners across the entire care continuum and not just LT vaccines. So some of the deliverables that we are working with our awardees and contractors to develop over the next six months are listed here. Uh, it's important to note that while some of these may be specific to our program, uh, the goal is to make sure that these resources are scalable for everyone across the country um, and, of course, disseminated uh, appropriately. So. Uh, again, you'll find that these deliverables align uh, very closely with the uh, challenges identified by the field um, and the objectives of the charter. So just to give you all a sense of the recent discussions uh, taking place on the uh, community practice calls, um, I've listed some of the previous topics here. Um, again, I'll be more than willing to uh, share recordings of those webinars, uh, share the uh, PowerPoint slide decks for other resources from those calls. Um, just be sure to, to let me know. Um, just looking at the uh, December call, uh, we discussed common barriers to health information exchange between LTPAC settings and providers across the entire care continuum. Um, and then for this call, it was not just listing out all the barriers that exist, um, but really making an attempt to drill down on each barrier um, and discussing potential solutions to resolve them. Uh, in January, we had uh, two leading positions uh, lead a discussion of how payment reform uh, is impacting the value proposition for LTPAC and HIE. Uh, and in February, we had the Missouri Quality Initiative for Nursing Homes uh, discuss proven strategies for engaging and communicating with LCPAC facilities. Uh, just yesterday for our March call, uh, we had a really great discussion on patient matching and the associated challenges with uh, matching data uh, with the LCPAC setting. If you all have um, any questions about any of the material presented today or any specific questions about the advanced interoperable HIE program, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to anyone from our Health Information Exchange Programs team, um, and we'll be glad to speak with you all. Uh, thanks again for joining the call today and allowing us to give an overview of some of our efforts. Ellen, I will pass this back to you. Super. Thanks, Larry. 
so we have had the panel open for questions, and there have been some questions that have come in. And um, the ones that we don't get through, I'm sure, can be uh, answered privately via email. And one thing to mention about email, there was the slide sent out to those who registered, and it might have ended up in a spam folder. So if you want to check that, it came from um, uh, the email D Young. And if you want to check to make sure that you have it, um, it might be in your uh, junk mail folder. You want to pull it out of there. So one of the um, questions that came across that I found intriguing was talking about that this is Patient Safety Week and kind of the patient safety um, connection between HIE and long-term care. And Larry, you mentioned it a little bit when you talked about data matching. And so I was hoping that, um, Bill, you could mention the, the patient safety aspect um, in regards to errors and malpractice. Um, and specifically data matching and how you saw that come up in your um, review. Bill? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were. Um, um, the, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, you know, like I said, um, very few of these, in fact, really none of these studies looked at, at harm or, or safety issues in any ways. Obviously, there's a lot of implicit um, issues. Um, we did find that um, patient, um, uh, patient matching, uh, you know, was definitely an issue. There, there are methods. Um, that have been developed around um, uh, probabilistic matching for patients. Um, th there are some who advocate um, national identifiers, either required or voluntary. Many other countries have um, uh, required patient identifiers. Um, but that, um, other than it coming up as a barrier, um, it really wasn't addressed in um, any of the um, uh, studies of the uh, outcomes from HIE. Larry, did you have anything to add to that? You know, I was just going to say that we did discuss after the call yesterday, um, you know, as Bill had mentioned, uh, there, there are obviously a lot of um, barriers associated with patient matching right now. Um, so after the call, uh, one thing we did not get a chance to do was specifically tie this back to um, LCPAC and how we could actually um, resolve some of those issues there. So we were actually looking at having a, uh, a follow-up call um, based on the webinar yesterday. Um, we can really tie back to, um, you know, how it's impacting the LCPAC setting um, and how we can help resolve some of those issues. But the, the call yesterday was really, you know, outlining and, and getting a sense as to what those barriers were and a general overview of what's happening across the country. Sure, thanks. Um, so building on that, you had talked about milestones that you have in, in these new um, projects that ONC has funded. And, you know, Bill had also mentioned, and I believe that it came out in Jenny and Liz's presentations as well, you know, judging effectiveness and efficiency. So how do you think um, in the future these things can be evaluated? How can HIE or the program or exchange with LTPAC be evaluated so that you can come up with you know, something that you can go across and determine comparability. I'll direct that to you, Bill. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I didn't. Um, I, I thought you yeah. were. No, no here's, the, here's the thing. I'm tying the two together. So okay. OEC has come up with some uh, new projects, and in that there are milestones in those projects. But the questions that are coming across from the folks that are listening are one of the things that came up in your evaluation of HIE was that they weren't necessarily comparable. And how can that be rectified so that moving forward they are comparable? In fact, someone had mentioned those there need to be a certification program for HIE similar to EHR. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, I I don't know that um, that that certification of, of um, uh, HIE is going to necessarily help that much with the research side of it. I I think that um, um, the uh, the 
the, you know, like any area of research, there needs to be a, a kind of common terminology. There is um, some kind of commonly accepted terminology at a high level around um, HIE, um, uh, 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 the, the, the query versus direct or push versus pull, as it's sometimes called, um, uh, public, private, things like that. Um, but um, uh, it doesn't get into a lot of granularity that would be helpful for research. And so if you could get down to the level of really kind of describing um, things like the the setting, um, you might want the, the, the clinical setting, emergency departments, um, uh, surgical wards, internal medicine wards, et cetera. Um, if you, uh, there might even be issues related to the funding. Are, is the HIE part of an accountable care organization or a primary care medical home, or is it in more of a traditional fee-for-service setting? Um, I think, um, you know, ideally, um, you know, there's obviously uh, limited resources, but ideally the, the HIE research community would come together, perhaps it's something that ONC or AHRQ could support or fund, um, to really kind of define um, some attributes about HIE so that they could be more comparable. I think one of our problems in our um, systematic review is that the, the uh, studies we looked at were, were only as good as what was reported in the, the paper that was published. We didn't really have the resources to contact authors to get a lot of details about um, what may have actually been been happening in the um, HIE implementation. So um, I, I, um, I I think that developing a set uh, you know of uh, kind of a commonly agreed upon set of attributes about HIEs would facilitate the research. And, and speaking of the research, can you talk a little bit about the theoretical or the conceptual frameworks that you did uncover as you went through these um, reviews? I had a question that came up. Um, regarding, you had mentioned that there was um, poor use of frameworks. No, um, this is Karen. So th they're really, they weren't reported in the evaluation with one exception. The technology um, acceptance model was mentioned as, an evalu as part of an evaluation. And that, but I think we were concerned because we didn't see that either in the implementation, underlying framework for the implementation or for the evaluation. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, so, um, you know, I think we have a, a few more questions, and some of them get a little bit technical. This one, I think, is appropriate for you, Liz. Um, the question has come up, and I've, I've heard it before, between um, um, sex and gender in the, um, the common data elements. The, the gender in, co in the common data elements? Yeah, um, with you... Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. In the common data, yeah, in the common data elements that are listed, um, what is the difference when you say sex as a common data element, and why are we not using the term gender and, and the standards that would go under that? Yeah, um, and I don't have the specific details, but I, I think I think it is inclusive. You know, the the various components of it. I um, we can follow up with like what the specific definition is on that. Um, um, and so because it's, it's it's highlighted in detail, I just don't have the the yeah um, explanation for me. But we can follow up with you on that. It's it's included in the goal. Okay, um, because that's one of the things that also has come out in that. Folks could be thinking that they're exchanging the same data, but it doesn't exactly fit. And what needs to happen for us to get to a point where the elements that go across are the elements that the clinicians need and expect? Jenny, I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to add in the last few minutes um, in regards to the, to the issue with LTPAC. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, one of the um, focuses under the uh, IMPACT Act is standardizing, meaning aligning uh, these assessment data elements. And um, in, in aligning these data elements, uh, standardizing them, we are making sure uh, that we um, the same data element 
is being represented. And as we've been doing that work, um, uh, we've had to go through a, a variety of steps um, to uh, make sure the data element is um, parsed appropriately and, and we can look across the assessment instruments to uh, actually see exactly what is the core question that any particular data element is, is asking so we can determine whether or not the data element is the same across these instruments. Mm -hmm. So um, I agree with part of the question, which is um, needing to have a common definition, common understanding in order to support uh, the exchange and, and um, meaningful reuse of that content. Um, I, I think um, identifying what uh, receivers need to know uh, is an important um, part of enabling health information exchange. And um, some of the work that CMS is, is doing is working with subject matter experts to identify um, the data elements uh, from these various assessment instruments, which of those data elements uh, would um, receivers of information um, find meaningful, meaningfully uh, uh, useful and clinically relevant. Uh, in exchange, and so um, we're working to identify those data elements and also link them to um, health IT standards. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, the last question is, uh, is very similar to that one, but it builds it up to one additional level as far as HIEs go, and so Bill, I'd ask you, um, the question is, how different are the HIEs that you look at? Is it if you look at one HIE you've seen? one HIE, or are they similar enough that if there's a benefit there, you can generalize it? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, you know, obviously there are some similarities. They're, they're all exchanging data, but they, you know, unfortunately exist in, in different health systems with different funding models, um, and um, uh, there's not a lot of um, similarities. In, in some communities, different um, types of HIE are developing. Uh, for, for example, um, I won't mention the name of any vendors, um, but for example, in cities like Portland, Oregon, where almost all the large health systems are on the same vendor system, the, that um, there's a, a way to exchange data within that vendor system that's kind of become a de facto standard. Um, uh, hopefully, over time, we would actually see the need for HIE organizations go away, and the ability to exchange data would just be inherent in um, the electronic health records. Um, we, we obviously need a ways to get there. Um, there's still a lot of questions about um, uh, who would bear the cost of um, uh, moving information since um, the organization taking care of a patient um, uh, does not necessarily, it, it's really a cost to them to, to send the data elsewhere. Um, that, you know, that maybe needs to be addressed as a, a larger aspect of our healthcare system. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the, the healthcare system as a whole needs to recognize that, that data needs to move with the patient. Um, the former director of AHRQ, Dr. Carolyn Clancy, I actually like her definition of HIE the best, which is that data follows the patient wherever they go. Um, obviously, we don't have that yet. Um, but mm -hmm. we need to move in that direction, and then that um, uh, sets the requirements for the uh, standards, um, the, the, like the ones, examples we just talked about, things like de defining gender and so forth. Um, and hopefully the ONC um, uh, standards advisory process will continue to build out um, the kinds of um, uh, data that we want to standardize so as time goes forward, um, we can move more standardized data uh, from one system to another and preserve the meaning when that data is transferred. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you to the presenters for a very interesting presentation. And remember that this is the first of a two-part webinar series. The next event is on April 21st. You can register for that by going to healthit.ahrq.gov forward slash events if you would like to register. And to obtain uh, continuing education credit, you need to visit um, the URL that is on this slide. And all questions will be answered. If they haven't been verbally, then they will be in writing. Thank you so much. Thank you.